This is the Mathematics Education Podcast from MathEdPodcast.com. Welcome to the Math Ed Podcast. My name is Sam Otten from the University of Missouri, and I'm pleased to have two guests with me today to talk about their study. Dr. Sarah Powell is an assistant professor in the Department of Special Education at the University of Texas at Austin. Sarah, thanks for being here. Thank you. And her co-author, Julie nuremberger Haig is just finishing up at Michigan State University, where we were actually together studying for a while. She's going to be going to Kent State University in the fall, so Julie, thanks for being here as well. Thanks for having us. We're going to be talking about Sarah and Julie's study uh, that they published in Early Education and Development, and the study is entitled Everybody Counts, but Usually Just to Ten, a Systematic Analysis of Number Representation in Children's Books. So we're going to dig into some, some children's books, which I'm really interested about because I have two preschoolers myself. Okay. But before we get there, I like to just get on the record people's grad school experiences so we kind of know where you're coming from. So Sarah, I'll start with you. Where did you do your graduate work? Uh, I did my graduate work at Vanderbilt University, and I studied under Dr. Lynn Fuchs in the Department of Special Education, and my PhD is in Special Education, but with an emphasis in Mathematics Learning Disabilities. Okay, and, and what did you kind of focus on for your dissertation? My dissertation was all about the equal sign and how students misinterpret the equal sign and how misinterpretation of the equal sign at the elementary grades causes problems when students are solving word problems. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And Julie, how about you? Uh, I'm finishing my PhD at Michigan State University now (laughs) uh, in preparation to start at Kent State in the fall. And Jack Smith is my advisor. And my dissertation is focusing on my primary research interests of analyzing models we use to teach students mathematics, specifically how movements affect student learning, because that's been under study thus far Mm -hmm. um, in cognitive science we have evidence that how we move influences how we think, Hmm. but that really has not been a focus of understanding how students must be learning in classrooms as well. And I focused my dissertation on walking on a number line versus using a chip model and moving chips Mm -hmm. uh, to learn integer operations. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned the study that we're going to be focusing on uh, deals with children's books. Uh, So I'm just curious, this is kind of a fascinating study, but how Mm -hmm. did it start? Where did it come from? Well, speaking of the equal sign, I had done uh, a textbook analysis about how the equal sign was presented in elementary school textbooks, and that article was published, and Julie read it, and she had just conducted an analysis, if you want to talk about it, Julie. Yeah, I conducted an analysis of children's books about shapes, Mm -hmm. and the reason for that was I saw a lot of issues with teaching teachers mathematics, uh, who, you know, who are going to be future elementary teachers, mm-hmm. and, and issues they were still struggling with, with geometry and mm-hmm. basic shapes. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to investigate where some of these ideas might be coming from, and I was going to do a textbook analysis, and then realized, no, shapes and numbers <laughs> all begin much earlier. Uh-huh. And yeah. so I looked at children's shape books, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. um, I had contacted Sarah because I saw her textbook yeah. analysis. Kind of to talk about the process and you know what, what did I do in terms of doing the analysis. And then we just started talking about common interest in mathematics. I had mentioned that for a while now, I was interested in doing an analysis of books about counting, just as Julie had done an analysis about books about shapes. So we started talking about that, started Skyping um, face-to-face to to Mm -hmm. flesh through some of these ideas, and then we said, hey, we should do this together. And so we just started, and we started the work before we had actually ever met in person. Mm -hmm. So she was doing some of the analysis, and I was doing part of the analysis. We Skyped each week to talk about the progress and just kind of uh, went from there. Mm Mm-hmm. So uh, I know folks can get details in the paper about your analytic Mm -hmm. methods, but I was wondering if you could just share with us a little bit about how you went about analyzing the books and how did you decide which ones to include? Because I can attest from the bookshelf (laughs) that's in my son's room, there are a lot of books out there. There are, yeah. With regards to what we analyzed, Mm -hmm. we both brought complementary perspectives of the kinds of things that we thought we should look for in trade books. Mm -hmm. Um, For one thing, uh, Sarah was really interested in focusing on the representations yes. because because of her background in early childhood mm-hmm. she was really focused on number number word and a pictorial at, representation mm-hmm. yeah and we were both interested in what numbers mm-hmm. 
our children exposed to. And you were interested in some of the, I don't know if the term is mathematical qualities, but Mm -hmm. um, if it's talking about 10, is there a base 10 representation um, Mm -hmm. with 10 in the book? Mm -hmm. Uh, What were some of the other things? And some of the grouping. So these results aren't in the study, but some Mm -hmm. uh, some forecasting of a second article. Mm -hmm. The reason we collected this data was if numbers were grouped or in patterns of dominoes, for yeah. example, for recognition, or were they grouped for repeated addition, mm-hmm. things There's, like were that. Were they in patterns for easy subitizing okay. and that type of thing? To make sure I'm understanding what you mean, so like there's all these pages where it's like, okay, we're talking about the number six, so there's maybe six flowers uh-huh. or six mm-hmm. coins, and are they arranged exactly. in any kind of structural way? Or, or is exactly. it, does it look like three plus three okay. together is six? Or just six things scattered. Or just six and... things scattered. And what are those six things? Are they six flowers? Are all the flowers the same? Or are they different? Uh-huh. Or is it three flowers and three puppies or, or whatever it is? Okay. So helping students start to think about these mathematical concepts really even before they're really thinking about these concepts. Right. Yeah. So, all right, got some interesting things to look at. And in the article, you have a list of the books that you we examined. How did that list get populated? We looked at several sources. First, we went to Amazon.com and did a search of, quote, counting books and number books. Okay. And we took the, tw- uh, they were ended up being four different searches, and we took the 20 top books in each of those four different searches. Mm-hmm. And the searches were by relevance and then by bestsellers. Okay. And so then we found all of those books Except for one, I think that if that's if that's correct, and then we looked at some sources that teachers and parents would have access to. So we surveyed several local libraries and pulled all of the books that would qualify as a quote book about number, and then we also talked to school librarians and local schools, a suburban school and a rural school, and looked at their collection of number mm-hmm. books about number. And we saw a lot of overlap, but mm-hmm. then we um, also saw a lot of books that we had not seen on the Amazon list. In fact. Many of the books that were in libraries and in classrooms were older books about mm-hmm. number, but they were important to put into our collection. So if you too. were a parent or teacher, these are the books that you would most likely see when you were thinking about, oh, I need a, a book about practicing counting skills. Where would teachers go? Library, school, Amazon.com. Mm-hmm. So we came up, I think the total is 160. I don't think. It was it, definitely around that. Yeah, it was around <laughs> 160 books. Okay. Yeah, so. Wow. Many of which I now own. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm speaking with Sarah Powell and Julie nuremberger Haig about their study in early education and development. So I'm now curious, you were looking at number, what numbers showed up, and then you were looking at representation. So let's take those one at a time. So what did you find with regard to what numbers were showing up? Well, we think it's unfortunate that most of the books stop at 10 Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't expose children to numbers like 11, 12, 13, 14, Mm -hmm. and beyond for the most part. And some even were only 1 through 8, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a little fun anecdote. The report's from the 80s, but that's part of why we named the book Everybody Counts, but Mm -hmm. usually just to 10, was was to allude to the report Everybody Counts by the Mm -hmm. National Research Council. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe it's around 65% of the books that we surveyed either stop at 10 or stop at a number less than 10. Mm -hmm. And kind of accessing my special education background, not only do kindergartners and first grade students and, you know, even preschool students have difficulty with the teen numbers, but we'll see students at third and fourth grade with a lot of difficulty as to recognizing the number 13 or writing the number 13 and that type of thing. And so it really does point that we do have this conceptual stopping point at 10, Mm -hmm. but we often stop there. Number songs stop there. (laughs) Counting books stop Mm -hmm. there. And we really need to think about if we want students to have a good understanding of the teen numbers and beyond that, um, what are some of the things that we could put in place? And it's obvious that many counting books are not fitting that bill. So one thing we thought our study contributed is that we already know that there's research about the problems with the terms in English mm-hmm. for the teen numbers, that mm-hmm. they aren't consistent, whereas several Asian languages actually are support base consistent. 10 understanding mm-hmm. by the terms alone. Mm-hmm. And so our study contributes to another reason mm-hmm. that English-speaking early childhood students um, might have difficulties with those numbers. Yeah. I also, so I mentioned I have two preschoolers, uh, John's almost three and Harvey's one and a half. And so they're counting and working on this. And I also just get this feeling that 
it's like this task that is accomplished once you get to 10. Yeah. Like you're counting. You're finished. And yeah. It's yeah. like, that's the end. Mm-hmm. I've achieved what I set out to achieve. Uh-huh. So for me, you know, like having the math ed background and going to grad school with Julie, where stuff like this would come up a lot. Yeah. I have made a point to go beyond 10, and mm-hmm. I, I kind of try to not great. have a specific thing. Like, yeah. sometimes I'll stop at 14, sometimes 20, sometimes That's 18. Great. And I try to just mix it up where it's kind of like, how far do we feel like going today? Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, like, sometimes we might not even go to 10, sometimes we might go later. But I just, I basically just felt myself wanting to break up yeah. the fact yes. that it's always to yeah. 10, and then we always celebrate that yeah. we made it to 10. Yeah. yeah. And it's done. really a cultural thing, too, because I think even, like, other family members, they're, like, ready to applaud once the little <laughs> yeah. little kid, once the little tyke gets to 10. So yeah. true. We're ready to applaud because you made it to 10. It's like, well, I have uh, twin nephews who are now three and a half and both my brother who is their dad and my parents who help out taking care of them. They know that I'm really interested in mathematics and I've talked to them about this study. And so my mom will say, well, what number should I stop counting? (laughs) It's like, don't stop counting, just keep going. But they do the same thing that you're talking about is not celebrating 10 as this end point, Mm -hmm. but let's count to 12, let's count to 16, Mm -hmm. let's count to 22. Mm -hmm. And it would be great if everyone had this knowledge Mm -hmm. and did this. But there are some counting songs that I've seen where they'll say, and the last one's 10. Mm -hmm. And I always talk about this with my students. (laughs) that's like who are pre-service teachers we should not use this song because there is no last Mm -hmm. one yeah but it kind of brings up another point that i think we'd like to talk about here is understanding numbers less than one yeah so So i was going to ask you about zero because zero in your graph that you have Uh in the paper zero behaves much more like the higher numbers (laughs) it does it doesn't behave like one through ten not featured um, much of the time in these books and so one of the things that um, is pretty common in the research literature is that we know that once students are introduced to rational numbers, many students have difficulty understanding them because they really don't think there is a number, first of all, less than one or any numbers that are between zero and one. Mm -hmm. And then kind of going with Julie's work in terms of negative integers, Mm -hmm. that then there are numbers that are less than zero. Mm -hmm. So, And so a phrase to to share with parents in early Mm -hmm. childhood to be cautious about that we talk about in our article is this idea idea of when you're counting backwards that one is the stopping point yeah. when you're counting backwards. Mm-hmm. That's when we just, you applaud. No, it, we don't it, apply to right, one. Yeah. That, or it might even be zero. Uh-huh. Like some, some people might bring up zero, mm-hmm. but then zero is the stopping point. Mm-hmm. Um, and granted, one is the first counting number mm-hmm. by definition in terms of set theory when and mathematics. An object, and yeah. a, a zero is the first whole number mm-hmm. in set theory. But but trying to think about ways that we can mm-hmm. talk to children about numbers mm-hmm. when we don't bring set theory into it. And it's, right. and it's not doing this all the time, mm-hmm. but it's having some awareness. Zero is featured in the collection of books that we surveyed less than 10% of the time. Mm. So it may not be talking about zero every time you're thinking about counting, but talking about it often enough so that when yeah. students are introduced to zero and this concept of what zero is and then later on how zero is a placeholder, Mm -hmm. that they've had some familiarity with this and probably seeing it in only a few books uh, is not going to make a difference for students. Yeah, and it seems like that could be some baby steps. Mm -hmm. Like, including zero, to me, doesn't seem like that big of a reach. Um, And then to get to more of these nuanced things that you're talking about could be maybe the next few steps. That gets to a point, I don't know if we're skipping ahead, and that's not included in the the current paper, but we did analyze uh, if these books worked with a math researcher or a math teacher, or even if a, a reading researcher or reading teacher had some input into the book Hmm. and it's a very very small percentage of the time so we have an idea that many of these books are just put together because they're easy to put together put one through ten on a page put a Mm -hmm. picture with it go Mm -hmm. to print and Mm -hmm. you can sell it Um, and that may not necessarily be the best thing for young children Hmm. i also am curious about what you found with representations There's an idea in mathematics that students should see number in several ways. So that's the numeral, so that would be the the numeral three. The word three, so that's Mm T-H-R-E-E, and then a pictorial representation, so three objects um, on the page. So we looked at how these counting books, these books about number, how many times they had all three, or if they had two of those representations, just one. There were no books that had 
zero because it wouldn't then be a book about <laughs> counting. Speaking but of zero, least, though. At least you addressed zero. Yeah. Yes, we did. That's exactly right. So our breakdown is that 49% of the books, so about half of the books, included all three of those representations. Oh, wow. So when a student was looking at a page with, let's say, the number three, they would see the, numer- the written numeral, the written word, and then a pictorial representation that they could most of the time touch and count Mm -hmm. to understand that this numeral three represents three objects, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Um, But then there were some nuanced differences. Uh, Some of the books just featured the numeral and the number word. Some just had the number word and the picture, and then some just had the picture and the numeral. And then there were a few books that only had a word and no accompanying picture and and that Mm -hmm. type of thing. Uh So there were differences there. So it speaks to, again, do these books have to have all three of these all the time? Probably not. But if you are picking out books, you should be cognizant that it would be nice if these were all combined so that students can really understand the connections between the numeral, the number word, and the representation. So in terms of practical use by teachers, Mm -hmm. daycare workers, and parents. For example, a benefit of not having all three Mm -hmm. might be that children have to generate the third one. Uh So there can be benefits, but as Sarah was saying, having a combination of all these different types of books and how they represent the numbers would be would probably be important right and the the students or whoever's working with the kids uh would already be also adding like the verbal one i don't know if that how Mm -hmm. that fits in but that one unless you have an audio book or something that has buttons that you push or whatever i don't know we had a few of those but yeah for the most part the word is being read and presented orally by you know an educator. Yeah, so that's already kind of a, a new additional representation that's mm-hmm. not in most of the books. It yeah. would be from the, the kid or from mm-hmm. whoever's with the kid. And so now Julie's kind of bringing up, you could maybe add the verbal, but also add one of the other ones uh-huh. that's missing. That, they, that's right. that they, they could pick up, hold up a card that has the correct numeral yeah. that yeah. associates with the word right. and things like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Several early childhood and even the borderline of early childhood, yeah, the early second and third grade, yeah. ha- have talked about the issues of have, that their students had not seen yeah. the number of words. At least it didn't mm-hmm. seem that they had. So I was actually really surprised because we really have a positive result, mm-hmm. I think, I, I where, so. where there were... Um, many books that included number words, yeah. and I think we were both expecting the number to be even less, mm-hmm. or the percent of books, yeah. because in practice, it seems like teachers feel like children don't get enough exposure to the number yeah. words themselves. I was surprised. At our percentage is 23% of the books only featured the number word and the picture, so actually they did not have the numeral. Hmm. So you could think about that as a deficit for books, but I know Julie has spun that in a positive way. Do you want to talk more about that? Well, if if a book always has the numeral with the picture, Mm -hmm. even if the word is available, this child might not read the word or attend to that word. And so having books with just the picture and the number word, once they recognize the number from the picture, Mm -hmm. they could associate in their own mind, Mm -hmm. I know the number is three and see how the number three is spelled. Yeah, Yeah, it might kind of bring more attention to the actual written word, where otherwise that kind of could get get skipped over. Uh That's interesting. So you started mentioning uh, parents and teachers, so I want to just ask you to say more about the implications that you see for this study if you're maybe talking to parents or if you're talking to teachers. I think uh, many of our implications are the same because they're working with this very young age group, but these books could be used with students who are older who are having mathematics difficulty. Um, Some of our implications, think about the books that you're choosing. It's okay if a few books stop at 10, but Mm -hmm. then you should try to find some that go beyond 10 or even stop before 10 so that there isn't this conceptual stop sign that students shoot up around um, the the number 10. Yeah, and... Because our culture, as you were mentioning with the songs, it's so (laughs) oriented to stopping at 10, Mm -hmm. we might even want to consider having a majority of books that don't stop at 10 in order to convey that message Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we can count beyond 10. And also, we've been really focused on 10 today, but thinking about numbers greater than 20. Mm -hmm. So we did Mm -hmm. see a little bit of a kick for the 10 numbers and um, 100 was featured in several books, but Mm. even if books did go to 20, then many did not go beyond that. And we know that students 
do have a hard time with those larger numbers just because they maybe haven't received as much exposure to it or as much practice reading those numbers and um, seeing those numerals. So thinking about even just going beyond 10, but then going beyond 20. Mm -hmm. And so going back to the difficulties with the English language Mm -hmm. for number words, just when the number words become regular after 20 Mm -hmm. is when these books are basically stopping. So 21, 22, then Mm -hmm. we get to start over at 31, 32, Mm -hmm. 41, 42. And that's where even the number word is more important because students don't see that as much and they do have to interpret the written number word often in the elementary grades. So giving them more opportunities to see that. It's probably not as easy to have 60 objects on a page and it may not makes sense to have 60 objects on a page in every book, but in some books it would be nice to see. Especially if they're grouped mm-hmm. yeah. in multiples of 10. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there any follow-up work that you plan? It seems like you have a lot of kind of synergies between your work, so is there any next steps? Well, just on this data alone, yeah. <laughs> um, this article focused on the earliest aspects of number yeah. and representation, mm-hmm. and we're writing a second article on the same data. Mm-hmm digging in more to the books that might have potential for later maths. So multiples of 10, different ways that they're grouped that could support multiplication, division, base Mm -hmm. 10 ideas, issues of zero, and Mm -hmm. looking at the books that involve zero. And what they, Mm -hmm. yeah. And and we're also going to write a teacher practitioner piece. Mm -hmm. It's just from this data. And then... And that would be in a mathematics education audience or what kind of audience? We would like to see it there or even a more a general audience but yeah this is a really good focus for early education because we believe this is when this young population of students are most uh, exposed to these books but really taking it beyond that especially with these skills that students are going to encounter once they enter the elementary grades. My guests are Sarah Powell from the University of Texas at Austin and Julie nuremberger Haig from Michigan State University. Um, so I have one final question. We've been having a lot of fun all along, so this one's usually <laughs> my fun question, but um, I'm just curious if you weren't in special education and mathematics education and this realm of work, yeah. what would you see yourself doing instead? And Sarah, again, I'll start with you. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I think if I weren't in the research game, I would probably still be a kindergarten teacher. Um, if I was still doing something in education, I really enjoyed teaching kindergarten, but then just ended up realizing that you could have um, a pretty large impact when you conducted research. And so I really just kind of took off with that. Mm -hmm. But if I could not do anything in education, I would most likely be an antique stealer. So I love like vintage antiques, primitives, and I like going to antique shows, and I think it would be really fun to travel around the United States, buy mm-hmm. antiques, and sell them. So, so you, you wouldn't want to just have a little <laughs> antique shop in one town? You and I um, want to actually do the Yeah, kind of... well, I think that being a dealer is more fun uh, yeah. you go from show to show. Uh, yeah. because I go to a lot of shows and talk to dealers, and you <laughs> see them at different shows. So, yeah. yeah, but the problem is I would probably want to buy too many antiques to keep and not enough to sell. (laughs) So I'd have to work the math on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now I have yet more insight into why we work so well together. Do you like antiques too? Well, the first part about if I weren't in research or teacher education, I would definitely still be teaching math. I love teaching math and helping. um, I began teaching math to help those who don't think they could be successful in math be successful in math. But if I couldn't do that, I actually probably be an architect and interior designer oh. together because oh. it's kind of the modern side yeah. of the antique side <laughs> you right come so in help me like work it in yeah you know? i was gonna say yeah, if, if awesome. you went for a style that that's the, right antiques be could be incorporated team. in yeah <laughs> good team in research good team in life yeah, so, yeah. more collaborations in the future uh, <laughs> And I'll just Who ask for a podcast to get a 10% finders fee or something. For <laughs> okay. Helping yeah. generate this idea. <laughs> Thanks so much for taking the time, though, to speak with us about your work. Thanks for allowing us to share. We're really excited about it. Thanks for hosting. I, it's so great that you do this for, for the field. Oh, thank you.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Math Ed Podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast financially, please use the PayPal donation button at mathedpodcast.com.